Hello and welcome. Few artists have made their mark on political and celebrity figures with such a cutting style over the past half century. When this British illustrator puts his flowing ink to paper, the result is guaranteed to raise eyebrows, if not shock. This week on One on One, meet the maverick and outspoken cartoonist Gerald Scarfe. The caricatured and often grotesque figures in the illustrations penned by Gerald Scarfe find their roots in his childhood riddled with illness. Drawing became his main source of entertainment as he lay bedridden for long periods with asthma and evolved into a career that has spanned a half century of parodying those in power. However, it was Pink Floyd's iconic The Wall album that brought Scarfe's work to an even wider and younger audience. His memorable drawings for the album and later the movie led him to other projects that even included Disney's feature-length animation, Hercules. Beyond the illustrations, Scarf's work can be found in exhibitions, theater set and costume design, and even directing shows and films. But it's his razor-sharp cartoons and drawings that remain the hallmark of one of Britain's most talented artists. Gerald Scarf, it's great to have a chance to chat with you. And of course, you're, you're, uh, you're famous for your distinctive illustrations, you know, about four decades in, in the time, Sunday Times, um, about, you know, dozens of years with the, uh, the New Yorker as well, New Yorker magazine. What, you know, you're more than just an artist there, more than just a cartoonist and an illustrator. How do you define yourself? Uh, well, I suppose artist is the term that covers it all, but everybody seems to know me as a cartoonist. And uh, as you say, I've been drawing for about 40 years in the Sunday Times. Um, and in a way, it's very, very boring drawing politicians over and over again. You know, I just can't wait to get away from it sometimes. In The New Yorker, I draw personalities, businessmen, show business people, and so forth. Uh, but then I've tried to take it further than that as well. And I, I work in, f I've directed films, I've appeared in films, I, I design films, I design ballet, theater, opera, uh, and I have used animation, I make sculptures. In other words, I produce my, it's all to do with seeing the world in a certain way, not always graphically with my hand, but sometimes designing things. But it's all vision out of my head that, uh, uh, of what I see uh, in the world around me, uh, put out there in some form or another as a firm form of entertainment. And of course, the world gets to see your, uh, your art, and uh, it's something that travels across the, the whole world. I wonder how it translates when you look at what is very unique British humour, satire, irony. How, from the feedback you've had, how does it translate to other audiences? Well, with the world growing kind of smaller in a way through the internet and so forth, I have a website on the, uh, on the internet, um, and I get requests from all over the world, and people write to me from all over the world. So I think it is broadening, but originally, I remember when I first started w working in America in the 60s, um, I worked for Time magazine, and I did covers for Time magazine. Uh, and I remember doing one where they all said, oh, this is far too English for us. I didn't know what they meant at the time, but looking back, I think I can see there is a different kind of humor, a different kind of culture there. Although it's more, much more intermingled now. As we know, America has invaded the world tremendously and its culture has invaded the world. So we're much more open to American ideas and, and vice versa. I think they've in, uh, taken a lot from the rest of the world as well. So the, hopefully my humor uh, translates if it's at a very simple level. Obviously, if it's particular about the politicians in my country or so forth, then it's much more difficult to understand. But if it's about uh, George Bush or if it's about, you know, uh, someone in a broad spectrum like that, people understand it. Now, your uh, work is quite cutting. Your cartoons, your satire is very cutting, and, and there's a risk of being seen as very anti-establishment. Does that bother you, or, or is it necessary to give you that street credibility? No, no, I, mean, I think I am anti-establishment. I, I, I see myself as a kind of a jester who's able to say to the king, you may be wrong. I'm privileged to have this position in a newspaper where I can actually criticize people, and I think that's healthy. I think it's, it's great to be able to criticize and point out that those in control may not be in control, or I don't think they are, it's only my opinion. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's a very healthy sign, really. Um, but I have, in fact, as you say, made my whole, a lot of my living being rude to people. Does it, does it bother you they might get offended by what you do? It doesn't because most of the people I, I offend are people in power. And I know that the people who look at the cartoons are not in power and they like to see their la leaders brought down a peg or two or deflated in some way or another. 
So I think that uh, hopefully, you know, the main population is behind me, although they may not like it. But the thing about uh, politicians, certainly in this country, is that I think they'd rather be caricatured sometimes than not caricatured because it means they've arrived. It means there's someone of note, someone, you know, who's worth caricaturing in a newspaper. They may not like it after a while, but, but uh, at first it means they've arrived. Do you have boundaries? Do you have topics you don't touch on? I don't touch on a religion, usually. I mean, that's a personal thing. And I don't t touch on people's sexuality. I would not make fun of those particular things because they're very, you know, much to do with, uh, with, with people's uh, uh, hearts, really. But when you look at your work, um, obviously there's a lot of commentary in it and, it's, and there's that sort of political element. From your own perspective, how important is it to have a sense of humour in what you do? Oh, terribly important, I think. It's, I mean, it's just such a crazy world. If you haven't got a sense of humour, you go, cra you go crazy yourself here. And I think it just helps to see it all with a sort of wry smile. Just look at it and say, you know, it's typical that would happen and so forth. Um, I, um, I was an asthmatic child, and I think those days when I was bedridden and in hospital and so forth, if I hadn't had a sense of humour, I would have broken up in those days. Um, it, was, uh, it was my release, and still is my release. And um, I like to sort of make a joke of as much of it as I can. Did you, did you ever get any feedback on the, the kind of caricatures you did? Because, of course, people like Margaret Thatcher, who were great material for you, or, or even Tony Blair and George Bush, these people, do you ever get any feedback on how they react when they see these? No, I haven't. I mean, I think it's, in a way, beneath someone of that stature's dignity to react, to show that they've been harmed in any way. And as I was saying earlier, I think it's all grist to their mill. It all helps them uh, with, in their uh, you know, elevation. Now, when you look at someone, say, like a Margaret Thatcher or a Tony Blair, to what extent do you draw what you actually see, the, you know, the, uh, the actual features as opposed to the perceived features, that is, what you know, the person represents with their position and power and so on? Well, I often, when they first come to power, I often start off drawing them quite representationally until I get the feeling of the character. A uh, caricature must come from the character uh, itself or from the character of that person. And you mentioned Mar Margaret Thatcher. And I wasn't a fan of Margaret Thatcher, but she was undoubtedly a strong woman. And her aggressive attitude, her sharp, probing attitude, always came through into my drawings. And I could draw her as an axe or a pair of scissors or something acerbic and cutting, always. And that's because she had that character. I couldn't have drawn our Prime Minister John Major like that because he was a soft, much greyer character. He didn't have the ability to be drawn as an axe. He didn't have that cutting edge. Uh, so it comes very much from the person themselves, really. You have to, you know, try and assess them. I mean, I almost think of myself t sometimes like a kind of computer. I assess things from TV, from newspapers, reading about people there. Then I, I might meet them uh, and get something from them. And it goes into my head, down my arm, and onto the paper. That's the way it should work. Now, I noticed with some of the cartoons you did about George Bush that the, the representation was more about the situations, like, you know, pushing troops off a cliff into, you know, a sea of coffins. Oh, well, it's often like that. It's often about what they're doing, you know, what they're doing that I disagree with, I don't like. Yes, I, I, Bush is great material for me because he's, once again, a bit of a villain in my eyes. And uh, as we know, the villains make the best characters to depict. Uh, they're not the best characters in life. And if you go to a play or anywhere like that, the villains are, much, in a way, more interesting than the heroes. The heroes are boring, you know, the good-looking heroes, the guy that... But when the, when the villain comes on, everybody goes, Ugh. And you were born in, uh, in London in 1936, just in time for World War II. Just in time, aren't <laughs> I lucky? And I wonder what, what you recall of that, that uh, early, those early years in wartime London. Well, um, of course, my parents tried to hide the war from me, but... My father was forced to join the RAF, uh, and he was absent from home a lot of the time. And then eventually my mother and I used to follow him around the country to wherever he was posted. But my memories are very sort of simplistic, really, I suppose. I do remember um, going down into the cellar of our house when the air raid started. There was an air raid siren. We would go downstairs into the coal cellar. Um, and I was always scared at that point, not of Hitler bombing London flat, but of the wolf that I thought lived in the cellar. Someone had told me there was a wolf in the cellar, you know, and I was more scared of the wolf than I was of Hitler. Uh, so I have those kind of memories. And then, uh, you know, uh, we left London, but it was, a, it was a very anxious time, and I think that anxiety has 
uh, together with my asthma, has fed into my work. And I, I'm still a very anxious person. And drawing is very therapeutic. And when I can put my ideas onto the paper, I feel a lot calmer, a lot better afterwards. And the drawings that I make, which are horrific and grotesque sometimes, are not what I'm advocating. They're what I'm scared of. They're things in life that I'm, I'm worried about, you know. I'm worried about wars and things like that. You started drawing as a result of being bedridden, as you say, with, with severe asthma. Mm. Um, you also limited the amount you could interact with friends at that age, you know, an important f formative uh, yeah. aspect of childhood. To what extent that, did that affect the way you were as an adult relating to people and, and the kind of friendships you made? Well, yes, I, I was a very lonely child, very lonely child. And my brother was born after the war, which was like seven or eight years later. So there was a distance there. So for all those formative years, I was a lonely, sickly child with only my drawings to communicate with. There was no TV in those days. There were very few movies that I could go to during the war. And there was the radio. I used to listen to the comedy programs on the radio. So I think I was a very isolated child. And that isolation is probably still within me because, as they, they say, you know, give me a child to the age of seven I'll, and I'll give you the man. So I think that still remains. Although over the years I've learned to be a lot more friendly. And personally, I, you know, I, I like talking and I like chatting to people. Uh, and um, it's just my drawings that are sort of isolated and angry. Joel, I'm going to ask you just to hold on as we take a short break here with one-on-one. -on -one. We'll be back with more in just a moment.